Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion for January 12th. We are going to talk today about justification. Justification, it's big, long church word. It's what's going to occur again and again in our reading today. And so we'll get started and then I'll kind of introduce the idea of how we try to justify ourselves and in, in both kind of an immediate and an eternal sense. And then throughout the course of our reading, we're going to reflect upon um, the difficulty of that task and then how God ends up doing it for us. So there we go. There's the devotion in about 42 seconds. So off you go on your merry way. If you want more than that, um, feel free to stick around. Well, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I am at home today. Certain things have caused me to be at home. Not sickness related, so don't worry about that, but just other things in life. So you may hear Oh, of course, she's silent now. Um, I've got my two youngest at home here with me. You may hear them. You may see one of them running around. Those are all the noises of <laughs> healthy, happy children. So um, we're just going to, by and large, push through, not ignore them, but just push through and uh, do what we can do. Now, I'm going to be turning over this way, and I'm going to be having my glasses. That annoys me so badly. But... It is what it is at home here. Um, I'm going to be looking over there for my thing. I'm not able to print it out and hold paper in my hands, but that's okay. Uh, our reading today, Romans 3, 19 through 31, we'll get into it in a little bit, but it's all going to be about justification. I'm going to move my camera down. There we go, so that you can ah, see my hands. Justification. Now, um, we don't ever really say that word I mean, I'm sure that I don't use that word in casual conversation, so I'm absolutely sure that you don't use that word in casual conversation, but we talk about it, uh, I won't say frequently, but we talk about it often, I think, is maybe a, a reasonable thing. Now, the idea is sort of explaining, rationalizing, excusing what either we have done or what someone else has done. So let's let's take maybe um, uh, an, an example on, on the road, driving. All right, so um, you're driving to school in the morning or to work in the morning, and somebody zooms by you and cuts you off and then psh, buzzes on their way. And you're like, ah, that person, who do they think that they are? Okay, now, unfortunately, there is not a chance for that person to justify their actions, for them to provide some kind of reason or rationale or excuse for why they might be doing that. Now, let's consider that they have uh, a family member in the front seat who is, like, bleeding profusely. And I don't know why they haven't caused called an ambulance, but for whatever reason, they got in the car and they are driving their family member to the hospital and like blood is gushing out of, they need to get to the hospital right, right now. And they're not worried about trying to be polite. They're worried about trying to save their family member's life. So yeah, they cut you off and you just need to deal with it. They have properly justified their action. There's a very good reason for them zooming in front of you and cutting you off. Um, and that's trying to save the life of another person. That's an excellent reason for doing pretty many things. Not everything. Um, but saving a life is a good... Oh, my computer just... That's fine. It went into sleeping. Um, saving a life is a good justification for doing plenty of things, right? Plenty of things done in the name of saving lives. Now, if they were just, now let's consider another justification. If they had overslept and they were zooming to work because they don't want to be late for work because they overslept, well, that's a bad excuse, right? We all have, I'll say, equal importance as we're driving to our places. Now, sometimes, again, that's just been defeated by what I said earlier. 
unless there's <laughs> unless there's a good justification, right? Because someone's late does not give them uh, the right to whoosh, zoom in front of you and off they go because they overslept. Um, saving the life of a family member does give them that right, I'll say, although you don't really know why they've done that. So that's that's kind of one of the breakdowns of this example. You're not able to hear the justification for their actions, and you're not able to assess whether that's a good reason or a bad reason. All right, let's take maybe another example. I think we're kind of hitting at the heart of justification. Another example, someone comes up to you and has a different opinion than you on an issue, right? I'm not going to delve down into a particular issue. That's not the point. But someone comes up to you and they think this way and you think that way on a thing. Uh, this never happens because we can't have calm, rational conversations with each other, which is kind of a pity in its own right. But anyway, suppose that both of you were reasonable individuals, which you both are, by the way. Suppose that you were both reasonable individuals. Suppose that you both had the maturity to calmly and carefully and slowly hear about the opinion of another human being. What a world that would be. Anyway, the, the person has that view of the issue and you have this view. They're going to provide a justification for that view. They're going to lay out, here's the reasons why I come to this conclusion. And they may relate to you some personal story about a thing that's happened to them or a thing that's happened to a person they know. They may have uh, certain other thoughts on issues that have led them to take that view. Now, you could also provide a justification for holding this view. You have other different, not good, not bad, not right or wrong, different experiences which have led you to take this view. You are concerned about other different things that that view is not concerned about. And so you are able to articulate, you are able to justify the position that you hold. Now, maybe you're not able to do that, which is a scary thought in its own right. You have no idea why you hold a certain position, um, but you do. And so you really have no justification at all. That's just kind of how it's been and how you're going. And you have no reason to, uh, to change. You have no justification for doing what you're doing. What I'm trying to do in these examples is take this word out of the realm of the church, because that's where we typically tend to hear it, and to show you, you do this throughout your life. You do this, I won't say every day, but you do it pretty often. You justify things. You justify purchases. My socks have holes in them. Pretty many of the pairs have holes, and I need to buy new socks. I'm justifying that purchase to myself by saying the clothing I own is in bad shape. I need clothes that are in good shape, so I'm going to justify the purchase of new clothes. Maybe you look in your closet and you see nothing that you want to wear. Ah, ladies, does this ever happen to you? There's nothing to wear. I have nothing to wear. And you justify the purchase of new clothes. Now, I'm not commenting on whether that's good or bad, right or wrong. That's a way that you justify your actions. You provide a reason, an excuse. We, we tend to have negative connotation, but you provide an excuse, a reason, a, a logical rationale for doing what you're doing. All right, let's kind of jump a little bit into the church and talk about justifying with relation to God. When we start talking about justifying with God, we're providing God with a, a reason, an excuse, a rationale for us being how we're being and doing what we're doing. As we're going to see in our reading, there's only one good reason. All of the other reasons are bad reasons, are wrong reasons, are reasons that will send you to hell. 
there's one reason for being the way you're being that God will accept. And that's okay. God has done, God has chosen to do that, to allow this one way of justifying ourselves and saying all the rest of them are no good. So there we go. I need to wake up my computer. Now again, last time we did that kind of manuscript, I think that would be helpful. It's just me being here has sort of limited what I'm able to do. So I think we'll return to that next time with me showing you the way the words are. I won't even show you on my screen because it's going to look terrible, but um, I've done it. If I can figure out a way, maybe I'll link it down below. But anyway, um, today, if you have a Bible handy, oh, a special guest is in the vicinity. If you have a Bible handy, today would be a tremendous day to have your Bible with you. If not, that's okay. You certainly don't need it. Here, come here. Do you want to come say hi? Hi. Oh, come here. Come let me have you, little thing. Hi. Oh, here's a sweet special guest. Can you wave? Oh, there you go. Good, honey. Do you want to stay or do you want to go by Mama? Um, yeah. Okay. Off you go, honey. She is quite the wiggliest of them all, so um, that's okay. That's just how it is. Anyway, I'm going to read through, and I'm going to kind of talk through. There's, there's two major steps, things, that are happening in our reading. I'll talk through them. I won't be able to show you, so it'll lose a little bit, but if you have your Bible, that can help make up the difference. So here we go. I'm going to read, and then I'm going to talk and come back to you. Romans three nineteen through 31. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. There's a couple of things that are, get my chair good, a couple of things that are happening in our reading today. Remember last time and the time before, we had heard the phrase, the Jews first and then the Gentiles. And Paul had been kind of explaining, I had explained that in a chronological way. What Paul is doing now is saying there was, at one point, a distinction. The Jews had this thing first. The Gentiles got it later, maybe in a different way. But Paul is now showing that those distinctions, being Jewish or being Gentile, really, although they do have some um, distinction in certain areas, now as we talk about justifying, those distinctions are meaningless. The, the Jews justify themselves the same way that the Gentiles do. And Paul is talking about that at the beginning of our reading and again at the end. Right? He talks about, last time we heard, we had um, that, that third section, law giving and law having. And Paul talked about the Jewish people received God's law on Mount Sinai, Exodus um, 24 through like 28, 29, 30. The Jewish people had received God's law. They had it. I, I held that Bible in my hands. 
And the Gentiles sort of had not a different law, but they had the law on their hearts. They had their conscience, which would say to them, hey, friend, you're doing stuff wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. They had God's law, not in a, in a physical way held in their hands, but God had inscribed the law on their hearts and given them this device, this conscience, that sort of acted in a lawful capacity. It would stop them from doing bad things, and it would try to help them do good things. So the Jews and the Gentiles got the law in a different way, and, and that was a true distinction. Now, when we come to the idea of justifying, Paul says the law doesn't justify. And he's, he's kind of evening the playing field. He's expanding this to include everybody. Jew or Gentile doesn't matter. When we start talking about justifying, nothing, there, there's no distinction. He actually says that. He says that a little later. We'll get to that. But um, he talks about when God gives the law in verse 19, every mouth may be stopped. doesn't matter if you're a Jewish mouth. doesn't matter if you're a Gentile mouth. And the whole world held accountable to God. doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you know. The, the law flattens everything out, everybody out. There, there's not differences or anything. It just it levels the playing field. And basically, you're no good. Friend, you're no good. You can try to justify yourself. It's not going to work. You can, and, and we can see that as we look out at other religions, but just at people in general. People try to find purpose in life. They try to find, they, they try to, how do I want to say this? Value themselves is what I'm trying to say. Um, so think about, here's, here's a very particular example. Think about Facebook posts, right? Nobody posts a picture of them when they're sobbing because something terrible has happened. No, no one does that. People post pictures of themselves on vacation. They post pictures when they're going out to a nice restaurant and eating a delicious meal. People post pictures to, uh, I think for one reason, to show that their lives have value, to show themselves even that their lives have value. They're trying to justify their own existence. See, I do these things. I have these things. I eat these things. Therefore, my life has meaning and purpose. As Christians, um, now we can certainly do those things. We can eat nice food or go places, but we don't do them in an attempt to justify ourselves because that's not going to work. Eventually, you're going to realize that all those trips, all those places don't provide any meaning in life. Those nice foods don't provide value to you. Instead, as Paul is going to point out, God is the one who justifies. God is the one who provides value to your life. And he does. He does provide value. He says that you are a valuable person. You are a worthy person because I, God, because God has made you to be that way. Not because of anything in you. And let's get a little bit, come on now, computer, a little bit into it. Paul says, I have to go off memory here. There we go. Oh, it's back. Um, in verse 22, there's no distinction. All have sinned. All have fallen short. The law is, whoosh, it's a, a, a leveling flat playing field. Everybody's the same. Jewish, Gentile, tall, short, old, young, whatever. Adjective, non-adjective. Um, we're all in the same boat. All of us together are the same. Nobody can do it. And then he immediately launches into Okay, how does God do the justifying? We can't. We can't justify ourselves. There's no excuse that we can present to God that he accepts. There's plenty of excuses, <laughs> but none that God accepts. There's no reason for us being the way we are that God accepts. Instead, God has to come down and do the justifying to us. He, in essence, says, I realize 
that you cannot provide me with an acceptable reason for you being the way you are. But friend, but Sam, I'm going to make you reasonable. I am going to give your life that that excuse, so to speak. I'm going to give your life value and purpose and meaning and worth. God gives that to us. He is the one who justifies us to him. God is actually providing the reason that we are lacking. We we have no, uh, to, to be quite honest, we have no reason for existing. Like, outside, I, I got so excited. Outside of God, I mean, if, if there were no Christianity, if there were no Christ, if there were no God, there, there would be no purpose in life. And why not suicide? But there is a God. <laughs> there is a Jesus. And we do have, we, we gain that God gives it to us totally outside of us because he wants to. He wants to justify us. He wants us to, I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead of the text a little bit. He wants us to be his people and to live with him forever. And God does this work to, to accomplish that because we in ourselves could not accomplish it. God has to do everything. We're unable to justify ourselves, to provide a reason that God will accept, an excuse that he says is good. So he gives us Jesus Christ. He sends Jesus Christ down to earth, who dies and rises again. And that faith, that trust in Jesus Again, not trying to turn that into a thing we do, but that's how God justifies. That's the one reason. I don't want to keep using the word excuse. Jesus is the one reason that God will accept. Oh, Sam has trust in Jesus. That's a good justification for for him continuing to exist and be. In fact, that's such a good reason that I'm going to raise Sam from the dead and I'm going to make him mine forever. That's such, oh, Sam, you've got such a good reason. Oh, friend, what a good choice you've made um, to have trust in Jesus. And you, your faith in Jesus is a very good reason. It's the only reason that God will accept, the only justification that God will accept. And your faith in Jesus gives a ton of good things. Paul's going to going to hammer uh, time and again over the next few chapters and the course of the book how good of a justification that is. It's a, it's a very very good thing. All right, let's see where I've got. Okay, we're kind of at verse 27 now. I know I'm not in the text so much. I'm kind of talking about the text, but it is what it is today. Paul is going to compare that God is the one justifying providing us with that reason, which is Jesus Christ. And again, he's going to circle back. Now, that's not something that you've done. You haven't decided to have faith in Jesus. And and this is kind of a, a, a different topic. We're going to get into it later. Ah, surprise. Paul's going to talk about it later. Um, but, but you have no ability to justify yourself. Verses 27 and 28, he kind of talks about that. There's no doing that justifies, no reason that we can come up with for God to to accept us, for God to want us as his people. Instead, God is doing this thing, making me, making you, someone that he wants. And now God, God does want us. Cool. And then Paul is ending the section, verses 29 through 31, Again, with that level playing field. He had made the distinction between Jew and Gentile, which he will kind of return to, I think, in chapters um, like 7, 8, or 9, somewhere in there, when we talk about the olive tree. We'll come to the olive tree. But as far as justification goes, again, that's that's the one thing where it does. there is nothing about you that matters in terms of justification. No, no special thing. You're not... Regardless of what your mother told you, you're not special. You're not unique. God justifies every single human being precisely the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no unique thing that you have 
that God justifies you differently. Everybody gets it through faith in Jesus. And Paul says that. God will justify, I mean, verse 30, justify the circumcised by faith, that'd be the Jewish people, and the uncircumcised through faith, that'd be all the Gentiles. Everybody gets justified through faith in Jesus. That's it. That's the one reason that God will accept. All right. Now, he's going to come back to this kind of in the second half of the book. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We're going to, we, we as Lutherans particularly, are going to have to wrestle with this idea. Because this, this is like our, how we tend to view the, we're like, yeah, law, you're a stupid idiot. You can't do any good. Get out of here, law. All you do is drag me down. I don't want you around here. They're like, yeah, the gospel, Jesus Christ, he doesn't have anything to do with that law. And neither should we given the law the cold shoulder, which is not exactly the proper attitude to have. There is a way that we should think about the law. Now, again, not as the reason for justification. There's only one reason, Jesus Christ. But we still have, we don't give the law the cold shoulder. We still have some form of relationship to the law. And we'll talk about it later. Got it. Oh, you are so smart. Anyway, we'll talk about it later. There, there is a relationship that we have. Again, not as justification. That's just Jesus, the one thing. But we'll talk about it later. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for giving us value and worth in your sight through our faith in Jesus Continue to strengthen us in that faith every day of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming with me on this. Thank you for uh, the, the little bit less presenty way that we did things today. It's just I needed to be home today, and I was, so that's good. It's good that I can do my work here at home. I'm sure some of you are experiencing that as well. Anyway. Um, next time we will most likely be back in that familiar setting, most likely have the, the text there up in front of you and you'll be able to see my hands and not my face, which is good. That's good. I'll see you next time. God's peace be with you.